Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody back uh, and uh, like to get the uh, final session going. Uh, Joy, could you put up the, the session panel slide? Well, welcome everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Chris Hendrickson. I'm the uh, direct, faculty director of Traffic 21. And I'm happy to uh, uh, welcome to you to this panel too on environment, climate change and mobility for all. Uh, as it was clear from the secretary's comments in her keynote address, uh, climate change and what to do about climate change is very much on the uh, uh, consideration for uh, uh, transportation professionals. And it's also very prominent in the news right now with the Glasgow uh, meeting going on. We have uh, three uh, knowledgeable professionals uh, to be on the panel. Each one of them will speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll have time for questions after they speak. Uh, the first speaker will be Rachel Neeler. She is uh, currently Deputy Director for Transportation Technology and Policy at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, formerly, she was at uh, the Department of Energy as a senior advisor, and we're very proud to uh, claim her as an alum from our doctoral program here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so with, it, with that, I'll turn it over to Rachel. Great, thanks so much, Chris, and good to see you. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here today, um, and thanks everyone for, for your time. <clears throat> so I'm really gonna focus my talk today uh, to this group around the administration's EV strategy and the various pieces in the proposed infrastructure and rec reconciliation bills. Um, although they're not final yet, there's a lot of really great proposals that support this administration's priorities in reducing transportation emissions. Um, there are a lot of challenges and opportunities for electrification and transportation, and that is a big piece of the decarbonization puzzle for transportation. However, transportation is currently the largest emitting sector in the US today and is not going to get to net zero or decarbonization through electrification alone. Electrification is a major part of the solution, uh, but hard to electrify sectors also need solutions in biofuels and hydrogen with an emphasis on helping disadvantaged communities. My remarks today are gonna to highlight a selection of federal investments through those two reconciliation, or the two um, bills, the uh, infrastructure bill and reconciliation bill um, that have been proposed uh, that I'm personally excited about, especially for electrification. I've been working in this area for a while um, and it's really great to see the spotlight being shown on uh, electrification in particular, but also just transportation decarbonization broadly. I will admit, though, that I would need triple or quadruple the time and to actually give due diligence to all the transportation decarbonization efforts across the federal government. Um, but I'd be happy to answer questions for any of the efforts that I might have arbitrarily excluded here. That being said, uh, starting at the highest level, the administration is committed to meeting this moment to tackle the climate crisis and has really set a U.S. decarbonization goal for all sectors by 2050, and a shorter term goal of greenhouse gas emissions reductions of 50 to 52% compared to 2005 baseline by 2030. These targets are really key in providing a vision and signal to invest in decarbonization within the U.S. Um, and apply to transportation as well. Part of the challenge with meeting the net zero transportation goals is the lifetime of these investments and the turnover of the fleet. Whether it's personally owned vehicles, school buses, transit buses, aircrafts, or port equipment and vessels, in order to get to net zero by 2050, we really need to scale up deployment rapidly. We're already seeing increases in electric vehicle purchases and growing numbers of EV models, even in different vehicle segments like SUVs and trucks, medium and heavy duty vehicles. And that's really in large part thanks to the falling costs of battery, batteries, which uh, has also had a lot of uh, federal investment, particularly at the Department of Energy. But to support rapid transportation electrification, the administration has targeted various aspects of policy support. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, colloquially known as the Infrastructure Bill, 
has dedicated $7.5 billion to building out President Biden's campaign commitment of 500,000 chargers as administered by the Federal Highway Administration in coordination with the Department of Energy. This program is a mix of, as, as it's proposed, the program is a mix of formula funding directly to the states to uh, build out the electric vehicle ne charging network, as well as competitive funding in order to ensure the network gets built out in a convenient, accessible, and equitable way, and doesn't result in a patchwork system that is difficult for EV drivers to navigate. Because we don't wanna uh, have any, any additional barriers to people switching to electric vehicles. In addition, the infrastructure bill has dedicated billions of dollars to funding school bus, school bus electrification, transit electrification, and port electrification. And the broader Build Back Better plan, and specifically in the reconciliation, reconciliation bill, um, there's additional tax rebates for EV charging and competitive grants to support electrification, as well as uh, EV incentives for plug-in electric vehicles, used plug-in electric vehicles, so both new and used, uh, fuel cell electric vehicles, and has even expanded into e-bikes, which I think is really, really great to see. Uh, there's also a lot of support for domestic manufacturing grants and uh, switching the Postal Service and the General Services Administration over to electric vehicles. And why that's important is because the GSA actually sets a lot of the procurement rules around uh, all the agencies purchasing their fleet. And so the Postal Service and the GSA provisions are really to support this lead by example um, effort and this whole of government effort to, to decarbonize transportation. There's also additional support for school buses and medium and heavy duty electrification. And finally, an, an additional uh, loan program office, additional authorization um, in order to de-risk some of these investments that industry may want to, may want to take, um, but they just don't have the, the business model yet. Uh, but, they, but they expect there to be one. Um, and so the loan program office is a way to kind of de-risk those investments. It's critical to invest in the infrastructure, but the government also has a, a critical role in regulating the efficiency and emissions of vehicles. So in August this year, the president signed an executive order that had really three major implications. First, setting a goal with industry and labor to support, uh, to, to support getting to 50% uh, EV sales for new light duty vehicles by 2030. Uh, second, outlining a schedule for finalizing the current proposed light duty cafe and greenhouse gas emission standards that are um, by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency. And then third is to begin work with those same agencies on multi-pollutant and medium heavy duty standards and also set the next set of, uh, or begin the next set of light duty vehicle standards at least through 2030. So these infrastructure investments and regulations are really critical to setting an irreversible path to net zero by 2050. Waterways and ports are also an interesting opportunity to reduce transportation emissions, especially in disadvantaged communities. Um, and with electrification being one of those, those major solutions, ports are really essential infrastructure that support local jobs and facilitate international and interstate commerce but they often have negative impacts in the neighboring communities and for port workers due to the emissions from the ships, trucks, and equipment. So electrification and drop-in biofuels are key to improving the sustainability of point ports. And the infrastructure bill supports that through the $2.25 billion for port infrastructure development program for, and, and that really covers uh, port electrification, worker training on electrification and electric and hydrogen re refueling infrastructure at ports. The final example I will share with my time here today are the recently published uh, agency climate action plans and the um, request for information on sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, just this past month, the government really recently uh, published agency climate adaptation and resilience plans to integrate climate readiness across their missions and programs 
and strengthen the resilience of federal assets from the accelerating impacts of climate change. As part of these efforts, agencies will embed adaptation resilience planning and implementation throughout their operations and programs and will continually update those adaptation plans. So this is really a, a good example of how the government is trying to lead by example. Uh, these plans are important considerations for procurement because they can lead to uh, transportation decarbonization by supporting and creating demand for low to no carbon technology, low to no carbon technologies or low emissions technologies. Um, and the renewable, uh, the, the uh, sorry, the requests for information, RFI, I was getting them, RFI and RFS confused. <laughs> the renewable, or <laughs> the requests for information on sustainable aviation fuels is uh, through the General Services Administration in order to consider sustainable aviation fuels and other sustainable aviation practices that can be adopted by the government, into the government procurement process. So the examples that I've shared today are just some of the highlights of the targeted solutions needed for different types of transportation in the administration's plan. These are some of the early steps that need to be taken in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. So the 50 to 52% by 2030 is really, it sets us on the path to get to that net zero by 2050. But all that I've said so far is, is certainly not all that's needed. Um, you know, due to the time here, uh, I've my remarks significantly undersell a lot of the hard work that our agencies continue to do, even outside the infrastructure packages, and completely sidestep some of the priorities of the administration on things like hydrogen, the battery supply chain, uh, domestic manufacturing jobs, and um, excited to hear Kelsey talk some more about the Justice 40 priorities of, of this administration, um, and those are happening across the government. But I'd be happy to take further questions on those in the panel. All of those different aspects, though, really emphasize my closing point that decarbonizing the transportation sector is going to be challenging, but it's a challenge we need to collectively rise to in order to address climate, the climate crisis. So thanks again for the invitation, and I look forward to the discussion soon. Okay, thank you, Rachel. That was terrific. Um, uh, as I said at the beginning, I think we'll try and hold questions till the end after all three panelists have spoken. Uh, uh, but certainly, Rachel, that is a very ambitious agenda, and I'm struck with uh, how it crosses over multiple modes, uh, which I, I think is really, really good. Um, can I get, Joy, can I get the second speaker? Um, uh, the second speaker is listed as Andrew Wishnia, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate Policy at USDOT. Uh, rather than Andrew, he was not uh, able to join us. We are fortunate to have Kelsey Owens, who's an environmental protection agency specialist within the um, uh, climate policy office. And um, she is the car career lead on electric vehicles and environmental justice, which is quite a range of topics to try and cover. Uh, so Kelsey, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, can everyone see and hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Thank you all so much for having me, um, and Deputy Assistant Secretary Wishnia apologizes deeply for not being able to join you today. Um, first, I'd be remiss if I didn't use this opportunity to thank the UTCs for your excellent hard work. We're so, so grateful for your work. Um, DOT is fully committed to advancing President Biden's priorities around racial equity, climate change, and economic empowerment. Regarding climate change, we know that transportation is the largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions in the US. So at DOT, we know that means that we have to play a major role in achieving the president's greenhouse gas reduction goals. The transition to clean transportation will involve the creation of good paying jobs, retrofitting existing assets and building new ones, making infrastructure more resilient, installing EV chargers and manufacturing the EVs themselves. And we see how climate action and environmental justice go hand in hand. Investments in EVs will benefit all of us in this effort against the climate crisis and will also be a game changer for communities of color who are disproportionately affected by pollution and the impacts of climate change. 
For example, studies have found that communities of color are more likely to live in areas that exceed the standards for certain harmful air emissions, like particulate matter and ground level ozone, two of the pollutants expected to be exacerbated by climate change. And EVs will also provide economic benefits as well. They're cheaper to run and maintain over their lifetime, which will aid low income communities. And this is especially beneficial for rural communities where people drive the farthest and spend a higher proportion of their household budget on transportation. EVs also have the potential to improve equity through the creation of good paying jobs in manufacturing and in infrastructure installation. So I'd like to share with you some of the tools in addition to those that Rachel discussed that we have coming um, that we're using at DOT to increase transportation equity and fight climate change. The first tool I'd like to discuss is the Justice 40 initiative. This initiative was created by President Biden and is a whole of government approach to ensuring that 40% of the overall benefits from certain federal financial investments flow directly to disadvantaged communities. It's a potentially transformative in, in, sorry, initiative that shifts us from just avoiding harm to proactively investing in historically disadvantaged communities. It's really pushing us to think critically about what it means to be a disadvantaged community and to understand the benefits and outcomes of our transportation programs. We have been honored to serve as one of the federal co-lead agencies with DOE um, in developing and implementing the strategy for Justice 40. But for us, the initiative really boils down to two key factors, understanding the drivers of a disadvantaged community and then appropriately understanding the social and economic benefits of transportation programs. Within DOT, we're currently working to develop a methodology for accurately and consistently identifying and quantifying the benefits of the DOT programs that have been selected for inclusion in this initiative. And we're anticipating that the new EV charging programs will also be included in Justice 40. The methodology development uh, is a DOT-wide effort that has pulled in our economists, our data experts, our subject matter experts, and our program specialists, among a variety of others. We'll also be holding public meetings to ensure that the public and our stakeholders are given the opportunity to engage in the development of the Justice 40 initiative at DOT. Another tool in our tool belt is our Alternative Fuel Corridor Program. The Federal Highway Administration has just announced our fifth round of new alternative fuel corridors, which is wonderful progress toward building out a national network of EV charging and alternative fuel stations to support long distance travel via EVs. This program, which was created by the FAST Act in 2015, recognizes highway segments that have infrastructure plans that will allow travel via alternative fuels, including electricity. The cumulative designations of round one through five for all fuel types, which includes electricity, hydrogen, propane, and natural gas, includes 134 interstates and 125 US highways and state roads, covering almost 166,000 miles of the national highway system in 49 states and DC. Of that total, Federal Highways has designated EV corridors, sorry, on approximately 59,000 miles of the national highway systems in 48 states and DC. Uh, currently, South Dakota and Mississippi are the only two states that don't have an EV corridor designation. We've also issued new guidance to help states use their right of ways to host transmission lines, build renewable energy projects, and support EV charging infrastructure. As Rachel mentioned, we're um, also proposing new fuel economy standards, which we estimate would increase the average fleet's fuel efficiency by 12 miles per gallon by model year 2026. That's a lot less pollution in the air and a lot of money that Americans will save having to buy gas. And the final tool that I'd like to discuss is a significant one, and it's our DOT funding. We're taking steps to ensure that the discretionary grant process considers the extent to which the proposed project proactively addresses climate change, sustainability, racial equity, and barriers to opportunity. Each applicant selected for discretionary grant funding must demonstrate an effort to consider these criteria, which will be rated separately as merit criteria established in our discretionary grants notice of funding opportunities. Our operating administrations will evaluate the degree to which the proposed project is expected to address criteria such as significance in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, promotion of energy efficiency, incorporation of electrification or zero emission vehicle infrastructure, increasing, sorry, increasing 
climate resilience, reducing pollution, recycling, or redeveloping brownfield sites, and lastly, addressing environmental justice concerns, particularly for communities that disproportionately experience climate change related consequences. We are awarding infra grants to projects that are reducing the amounts of miles traveled by cars, such as the Safe Streets Infrastructure Project in Los Angeles that is making non-motorized transportation safer, particularly in Black and Latino communities, or the investment in Georgia's port and freight connections, allowing goods to be shipped by rail faster and with lower emissions. Additionally, in April of 2021, we issued a new report clarifying how our programs can be used for EV charging infrastructure. Many existing programs have this already as an eligible use, and this guidance will hopefully expand how many funding entities can take advantage of that. This could potentially increase the use for EV charging infrastructure of $41.9 billion in federal grant funding in 15 specific programs. So we recognize that now is the time to finally address major inequities caused by transportation, including the disproportionate pollution burden from cars, trucks, ports, and other transportation facilities. When it comes to funding, we are committed to aggressively prioritizing and directing funding to historically underrepresented and disadvantaged communities to address racial, health, and economic disparities. We'll provide funding and technical capacity to invest in communities without displacement. We want to leverage investments in transit, climate, and emerging technologies to create new pathways to opportunities. And we are committed to doing our part, working closely with our partners in state and local government, industry, nonprofit organizations, and others to combat the climate crisis. And we're very much looking forward to working with you on this challenge. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I'm looking forward very much to the discussion to follow. Thank you very much, Kelsey. Uh, I think it's very, very interesting that DOT is broadening the criteria for discretionary grants. I think that'll have, have a real impact over time. Uh, Joy, can you put up our third speaker? Um, our third speaker is Rohan Patel. Uh, he is with uh, Tesla, uh, and he's the Senior Global Director of Public Policy and Business Development. And Rohan, I'll take, turn it over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, we can see you. <laughs> All right. And, and you've got a... Uh, a picture of my, I may have even sent that to you. It's a picture from me when I was actually in the government. Um, <laughs> I haven't worn a suit <laughs> in a long time, but I uh, uh, appreciate you guys having me on uh, and including us and, and really appreciated uh, Kelsey's uh, comments just a second ago and, and Rachel's uh, to start with. Um, kudos to both of them and their teams for uh, really taking on this challenge in a way that it needs uh, in, in the in the manner that it's it, it needs and the urgency it needs, um, you know, I, I think without uh, being too negative, the, the previous administration, frankly, was uh, was missing in action. Let's say, um, and and these guys have really have really uh, picked things up in a way that uh, I feel proud about. Uh, maybe I'll just I'll just say a few things and and uh, excited to get into a dialogue here. Um, one, one um, to the point about uh, equity and uh, environmental justice, um, much more needs to be done on this front. Um, you, you know, I, I, I say this stat, I say it humbly because it, it frankly, um, we, we can do much better. But 40, today, 40% um, of our supercharger network uh, falls within a disadvantaged community uh, based on California's um, definition of that term. Uh, so supporting those, those EV drivers in those communities and also those that are coming through those communities, um, resulting in additional economic activity and, and lowering uh, ground level pollution. Um, and, it, you know, this is, uh, this is something we're really aiming to, to get done, but um, having more uh, on-site stationary storage and renewable energy, uh, solar, uh, at our supercharger stations is, is something we're, um, we're 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 doing as fast as we possibly can. A couple of top line points: um, soft costs, something that the Department of Energy has worked on 
uh, since since my time in the in the government, and it's something that needs it needs a new name, frankly. Uh, soft costs. It should be called absolutely horrible costs that are stopping uh, good progress. Um, and maybe somebody could come up with something better than that. But we 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 have um, permitting challenges at uh, at the local level. We have um, significant. PUC related actions that need to be addressed in terms of uh, rate cases and the like. And there's a number of actions there um, and uh, good best practices from around the country that we should be we should be looking at. Just as an example, and this is not to pick on California because this exists in Texas and many other places, but we have a supercharger site going through permitting and interconnection right now that will take longer from soup to nuts to get into the ground and operational than a 12 million square foot uh, gigafactory in Austin, Texas. So it gives you a sense of just how significant these problems can be in terms of accelerating our, our transition. Um, speaking of the, the, the supercharger network, I think it's important to understand um, the scale and some of the particular problems that, will, that already are uh, in existence and will will continue to be problems as we have more and more money flowing into the system. And that's both throughput and utilization and reliability. Um, so right now, I mentioned this to Chris on our prep call, um, we, have a, we have a few stations actually in California, some of our larger stations that are literally have more throughput, just one supercharger location, more throughput than the entire Electrify America system in the United States. Now, the reason why I mentioned that is very, very low utilization rate amongst all charging systems. We're the highest by uh, a couple of orders of magnitude, but even ours is underutilized in many, many different areas. So what we need to make sure of is as we're throwing a lot of money at this issue, which I'm grateful for, I think it's the right thing to do for the planet, uh, we need to make sure that the re reliability is kept extraordinarily high and that the utilization rates don't result in a lot of uh, infrastructure that's in the ground that's that's not being utilized. And, and there are a lot of things there that we can we can do to, to get into the specifics. Um, maybe maybe a, a, a also a larger point um, which we can get into more detail on is, is this chicken and egg issue. It seems like in, in a lot of these types of uh, forums that we, we uh, participate in, there's this generalized notion that uh, if you build it, more, there, will, there will be more EVs. If you build the infrastructure, more EV, EVs will follow. And what we're seeing today and what we've seen in the past, because Tesla does both the infrastructure side and builds vehicles, um, is that it is the chicken and egg issue has been, and and I think going forward should be dispensed with. The key thing that will drive infrastructure growth, both in the private sector, in the utility monopoly sector, and the government side, is supply of vehicles. And the interest and demand, not just for Teslas, is enormous. The supply of vehicles is the key. Okay, so on the policy front, what's driving the supply to be literally 4x larger in Europe? In 2020, Europe had a 4x larger uh, both growth rate and also uh, number of vehicles. China is approximately the same, a little bit slower pace, but um, I think they're going to they're gonna be going gangbusters as well. And in 2021, it's, it's an enormous rate of growth. What's driving that? Policy. Policy is driving that because Tesla is about 50% of the market here in the United States, much lower percentage of the market in, in China and in Europe, even though we're the market leaders there as well. But why? The GHG standards and the ZEV standards and other, other smart policies uh, have been driving that growth. And I think there's the, the, on, a, on the climate front, there's nothing that's more impactful in the U.S. In the U.S. climate policy uh, arena than the GHG and CAFE standards on the transport side. Uh, tons of carbon, no question. 
And there, the EPA and NHTSA have both put out proposals. One of those proposals in the EPA case projected out in 2026 that they would have, that, that the, the US would have 8% electrification in 2026. And as a result, the rule is extraordinarily weak. Um, to that end, it's even cumulatively doesn't get, get us back to the Obama level standards that were announced in 2011 with agreement from all of the automakers in the UAW. Um, today, we can do way better than that. Last month in the United States, we were around 5% electrification last month. So to think that by 2026, we'll only get to 8% doesn't make any sense. I'm confident and hopeful that the EPA will uh, update their data and, and numbers and projections and, and get us to a, a much better um, program going forward. And, and uh, same as the case with NHTSA uh, with their CAFE standard. I think there in the CAFE program, they can't take into account, they're not allowed to by statute take into account electrification as a part of their policy mix, as a part of the mix of the fleet. But um, they still can do even more to take into account where the fleet is actually going. Uh, lastly, because this always comes up and I want to, um, I, I would, I'd be happy to answer questions on it, is uh, vehicle to grid, vehicle to home. And what, what are some of the, the issues there and, and how do we think about that, um, either at Tesla or just more generally? And I think there's a couple things, um, several challenges. Uh, one, we have today a huge network of uh, solar and storage on the grid all over the country. And it is already extraordinarily hard to rewire a house or to have the technology that doesn't force you to rewire the whole thing in terms of backup, um, to get the right infrastructure in place, to get the right interconnection agreements in place, to get the right permitting in place. And it costs money to do all of those things. That's with stationary storage. And, and solar, not something that you need, you may need in an emergency to, to, to move you and your family wherever you may need to go. So imagine if we have these problems today with, those, with a stationary asset that is designed to, uh, to, to feed back into the grid, what types of issues we will have with, with a, and, 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 and frankly, all across the country, Utilities are not excited about compensating customers for that uh, net metering uh, or, or the, the utilization of, of that resource. So finding ways to do that, important. And I think if we refine that for stationary storage and solar, maybe we can get to the place where it will make sense for customers to look at a vehicle to grid or vehicle to home type of solution. But until we can even solve for the basic uh, economic problems that exist for solar and storage, I think uh, it seems a little silly to be um, really contemplating this in the, in the larger sphere. Um, and, and I think the customer uh, and the ease of, of the understanding of the program is going to need to be front and center as we, as we think about these things. But happy to get into that or anything else, Chris. And again, really appreciate um, you having me on this. Okay, hey, that was that was terrific. Um, I'll, I'll follow up Rowan's talk with two anecdotes, and then we can get into questions. First anecdote is I spoke with my son out in Berkeley, California, this morning. Uh, my son is a uh, has BSMS PhD, all in engineering, has a house in Berkeley, uh, is trying to install solar on the roof, and is having trouble negotiating with PG and E about how to do that. So you are absolutely right on your comments. Uh, the second thing that happened today, I I was amused by. I was taking a walk in my neighborhood, and there's a, a visiting Tesla car uh, a couple of blocks from my house. And rather than being hooked up to a fancy uh, charging station, it just had a 110 uh, extension cord going out for charging. So I think it'll take a while, but I guess as a visitor, it isn't a big problem. <laughs> well, just, just, to, just to add to that, uh, Chris, I, I work at Tesla and have for five years now, and uh, I, I still have only a 110 volt to, to 
uh, charge my Model 3. We get about five miles an hour at our house. Okay. Usually that's what you get about. And okay. um, so, you know, 60, 70 miles every day. We have a full tank nearly every day. And my wife even commutes to Baltimore three or four okay. times a week. So Great. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Well, we're, we're ready to take a, uh, questions. You can either raise your hand or uh, put questions into the chat. I put a question into the chat, so I'm gonna start with that one. Uh, I would like to ask all of you, all three of our panelists, uh, how best to move beyond uh, kind of the initial buyers of battery electric vehicles. The initial buyers, I think, are largely uh, fleets of one kind or another. Uh, Amazon, uh, the post office is talking about buying electric battery electric vehicles. Uh, Hertz uh, was in the news for buying uh, a set of Teslas. And then after that, it's been kind of early adopters. People are really interested in bringing in new technology and using it and trying it out. But as we move into a broader uh, sales of battery electric vehicles, what's the best way to, to go about doing that? And I'll throw it open to your three panelists. I can go ahead first, uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, I think, um, and, and you're specifically talking about fleets, Chris. You're not you're not talking about the broader uh, light duty market. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm talking about the broad battery broader. electric vehicle. Okay. Okay. General Motors, all the rest of them are going to be trying to do this marketing in the future. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a good question. Um, at least with the fleets. Um, uh, and this, when you when we're talking about heavier vehicles and electrifying them, I think um, the major thing to happen is for battery costs to decrease, um, so that we don't, um, so that you know the the federal incentives that are in the reconciliation bill and the infrastructure bill um, are really great, but they're not going to be around forever, right? And so I think continued uh, reduction of battery costs. Um, so that these vehicles are cost competitive on not only total cost of ownership, but also at the at the point of sale is really important. Um, I think the the first movers are going to play a really key role because uh, for any known new or unknown new technology, I think there is some hesitancy for people to transition. And so those first movers are going to be able to assure people um, assure their colleagues, you know, give the anecdotal evidence that uh, electric vehicles are just better to drive. And I think we are hearing more and more of that in kind of the, the mainstream media as well. And I think um, the, the idea that we are all, are all um, marching to this net zero 2050 vision and having a lot of the automakers already talk about only offering electric vehicles in the future um, that's just going to increase that voice um, and that marketing um, by the, the automakers to, to really prove that electric vehicles are better to drive, not only because of the customer experience, but also because it's good for the environment. Okay, thanks. Kelsey, Rowan, anything to add? I think Rachel may have. Oh, sorry. <laughs> No, I, I completely agree with Rachel, um, and, and that's a question we've definitely been contemplating at DOT. I completely agree. Getting the cost down, getting the cost of batteries down is going to be absolutely key, and, and then still continuing to overcome the myths that, that existed and are, are being overcome by the industry, um, that you know, range is getting longer, performance is, is really exceptional in, in, in so many of the EV models that are currently out. For example, I, I live on a farm um, and need a truck to pull a trailer to get our animals around. So we've been thinking of, okay, in rural communities, what is it gonna take for rural farm owners to feel comfortable with switching, with making a big shift, um, which is technological and cultural away from diesel and gasoline trucks into electric trucks, for example. So there are, there are so many different um, uh, ways in which an EV can influence and, and affect a, a community. And we need to look at individual communities, you know, urban, suburban, rural, what does it mean to all of those differently and, and consistently 
and and then how can we how can we best uh, work to overcome the myths and increase um, uh, faith in, in the EV technology? I, I completely agree with you about trucks, uh, Kelsey. I, I really hope Ford is successful with their battery electric F F one hundred and fifty. Uh, I think that's a, a major development in the battery electric vehicle world to make that available. Other questions out there? If not, I'm going to ask another one. <laughs> Stan. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, uh, what an interesting article I just uh, put a, um, uh, entered on our blog was about uh, a company that was uh, looking to um, uh, repurpose old internal combustion engines with um, um, <clears throat> with, with electric uh, electric chassis systems. And the, the the argument was is that there's still a significant cost in building electric vehicles from a you know a CO2 cost. Um, so are there any efforts to kind of reduce? Whether it's from the building of the vehicles or the batteries reducing the you know the uh, environmental impact from the from from the actual manufacturing. Yeah, I mean we're so a couple things I would just say, uh, Stan. Um, there's been literally hundreds of millions of dollars poured into you know, junk science on uh, the long tailpipe argument. I hope we've put that to bed over the years, but the long tailpipe argument is that uh, both because of the battery uh, manufacturing footprint and also because in certain places, EVs are charging from a grid that is dirtier, more dirty than uh, in other areas that um, in fact, EVs may be uh, dirtier than um, internal combustion engine vehicles. And, and that's just, it's just flat wrong everywhere. You could literally be hooked up to a grid only being fed with, with coal energy, and it would still be cleaner than uh, the cleanest internal combustion engine vehicle. So th that's one, but two, hundred percent. I mean, this is like literally our mission in, in uh, in, is, is to drive efficiency, to drive additional re renewable energy um, at our building locations um, and, and in the grid generally, um, and bring down the overall GHG footprint, but other, other uh, types of wastes and create a circular system for producing uh, batteries and, and vehicles. And I think already um, it doesn't take very long to drive, whether it's a Tesla or another electric vehicle before you're already, um, uh, you're, you're already much better off than you would have been having bought an internal combustion engine vehicle. But yeah, we're, we're making, and, and I'll point you to, I'll send you, I'll put it in the chat here, but uh, we released a number of um, LCAs on this front and, uh, and, and happy to share the, the background materials on that. Um, and we'll, we'll be doing more in our 21, 2021 impact report. Great, thank you. Anything from the government programs around this area? Yeah, thanks, Stan. Um, there's a lot of work in this. So uh, one way I like to look at this is that the infrastructure package and the re reconciliation bill, um, both of those are really enabled by the long-term foundational work happening at the agencies to get us to this point, right? Um, EVs, we've been reducing the cost since uh, 2010. Uh, the cost of batteries was over $1,000 per kilowatt hour. And through um, a lot of research and development, not, even, not only in the government, but a lot in the government, but also um, on, the, on the industry side as well, uh, we've gotten that, that battery cost down to under $200 per kilowatt hour today. Um, and the goal for the Department of Energy is to reduce those even further um, by getting them down to uh, ultimately $60 per kilowatt hour. Um, that's what the, the DOE thinks is going to be um, very cost competitive with kind of any application of, of electric vehicles compared to gasoline vehicles. But they're also doing a lot of work in 
um, reducing the cobalt in the batteries um, because that is um, not only environmental impacts in consideration, but uh, we import most of our cobalt um, and it is a very volatile market. Um, and also looking at recycling the batteries. Um, so if we're gonna have millions and millions of electric vehicles on the road, what's gonna happen with the batteries afterwards? Are we able to either repurpose them or recycle them for their materials um, so that we are reducing the, the overall footprint of those vehicles? Um, but I think also really key in the investment uh, portion of this is we really want to bring as much of this, um, of the battery supply chain, um, bring it back to the, to the U.S. Uh, we're going to have to build capacity and we, we really want that to happen domestically because not only then um, is it producing jobs and uh, supporting our workforce, but it also allows us to regulate it a little bit better than if it's done um, uh, in other countries, right? So we can really put the, the, the um, proper framework that we want to see around reducing emissions um, on, on things that, that happen domestically. So onshoring is, is really a win um, for the workforce and for energy and emissions. Um, and the one thing that I would love to point out um, is that uh, inherently electric vehicles are just more efficient than gasoline vehicles, right? So even if the, uh, you do have to have the battery, um, driving on electricity is at least three to four times more efficient than it is driving on gasoline. Um, so I hope, I hope that's good uh, overview of, of the many things that we're, we're doing uh, in the government on, on batteries. And I'll see if Kelsey has any additions. Well, just maybe just to respond to one thing Rachel mentioned, um, and I think everything she said uh, couldn't, couldn't support it more. I think the industrial policy on this, uh, Europe and China have been way, way ahead of us on, on these items, and we've got we've to come back. And I think what, what's in the president's package is, uh, is getting to, to that level of, uh, of urgency that we need. But one piece that, that is not addressed by the the spending side is the trade side. Um, today, uh, Tesla is really the only entity investing in, look, for example, cathode production or even further upstream. And you don't have a lot of uh, significant um, efforts on, on this front in, in the US. But what, what's happening as a result of the Trump trade agenda, which has just been continued and is now the Biden trade agenda, is that raw material coming in, um, a lot of this, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, coming in from China, um, because the processing and refining uh, capacity exists there and does not exist here, is tariffed at 25%. So when we're trying to build the battery materials and, and new technology and create thousands and thousands of jobs, which we are doing in, in California and Nevada and, and uh, Texas, Unfortunately, we're taxed at 25% on the materials coming in to add value to the manufacturing processes that the administration would like to get done. If you bring a fully built battery pack from China, you're taxed at seven and a half percent. Now, how does that make any sense? It obviously doesn't, it's bad. I don't think it was the intent of the policy, it could not have been the intent of the policy, but it is the current policy and has been for many years now. And it's the type of thing that we've got to change and, and hopefully um, the administration can do, do just that. Well, we'd also like to start some domestic uh, uh, mining efforts of one kind or another or other countries for producing those raw materials. Uh, we're gonna need much more of a supply in the future, I think. Rachel, I wanted to follow up on something you were saying, and that is about um, drop-in uh, zero emission liquid fuels for uh, applications such as uh, aircraft. Uh, I've heard the argument that uh, the, the technical barriers and the economic barriers to doing that are, are quite high. And uh, unless there's some sort of a technological breakthrough, it might be better off thinking about offsets to try and keep our, our long distance air travel working. That is either 
uh, forest investments or uh, capture of carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere and then sequestering it. Uh, is there any talk about those that is an option? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, that is something that I, I breezed past in my in my uh, prepared remarks. But sustainable aviation fuels actually, um, and sustainable aviation strategy in general has been uh, an early priority for this administration. So in September, we actually held a, an event of uh, various stakeholders from the entire aviation ecosystem. So everyone from airports to airlines to fuel producers um, to the government agencies um, to labor um, and, and really brought them together to, to um, come up with a vision for sustainable aviation because we do want to get to net zero by 2050 without offsets. Um, and we think the way to do that, especially in the near term, is to increase our production of sustainable aviation fuels. So there are a number of producers that have put in commitments by 2030 will get us up to uh, 3 billion gallons of sustainable aviation fuels uh, online. And the airlines have, have, uh, have provided offtake agreements um, to, uh, to um, take on that, that supply uh, with the demand they have for, for their aircrafts. In the longer term, sustainable aviation is probably going to also include alternative fuels um, like hydrogen, um, maybe some electrification, although that's probably for, for smaller regional flights uh, because of battery, uh, battery load issues. Um, but uh, there's also a lot of opportunity, kind of low-hanging fruit in improving the efficiency um, of operations that can be employed today um, and just continuing to improve the efficiency of the aircrafts themselves. Um, so we actually have uh, had a lot of great stakeholders come together and um, recognize that in the short term, drop-in biofuels are probably how we're going to ramp up. Um, but that in the long term, we'll probably have a couple additional uh, fuel alternatives, um, but also different types of aircrafts in order to improve uh, the efficiency. So, um, you know, a lot, it's, it's not only um, the, the ramp up in production um, that is key, but we also want that, that as well to happen domestically. So in the uh, reconciliation package, there are two credits specifically for sustainable aviation fuels to get at your point, what you're talking about uh, in terms of uh, reducing the costs. Um, and I think what we, you know, the Bioenergy Technologies Office at the Department of Energy um, has a long-term plan on how to scale up drop-in biofuels. Um, and really what needs to happen is a, uh, uh, very rigorous scientific base to scale up of, of the fuels. Um, and that's only going to happen by, you know, the pioneer plants, the demonstration plants, and then getting all the way up to commercialization. And so we're really excited to have some companies, um, you know, suggesting that uh, they will be able to do this in, in the short term so that we can continue to learn and, and scale up that production. Um, but the two, the two credits in the reconciliation package are the blenders tax credit and the sustainable aviation fuel tax credit. Um, and so we're really hoping that those, those bring um, some of some of the producers are global producers. And so we really want them to support the, the um, support the sector here in the in the US. And so um, those are, are really to bring a lot of our production um, domestically. And I'm sure Kelsey has a lot to say about this too, uh, from the DOT perspective. You covered amazing information, Rachel. Um, I just wanted to, to add real quick how excited we are to be working with DOE and USDA on the sustainable um, aviation fuel grand challenge. We're really excited to see what comes out of that um, and, and com completely agree and recognize that um, uh, aviation emissions um, we're really excited that they're hopefully going to be coming down and, and we recognize the environmental justice issues um, that um, those communities that surround airports um, sometimes experience. So this is definitely a priority for us as well. 
Um, I understand Rohan has to has to drop out. I wanted to thank him before he does. Rohan, do you want to say anything else to to the group? No, no just just that uh, really appreciate being included and uh, and um, thanks for the panel. And as I said on the chat, uh, happy to answer questions afterwards uh, if there are any and and or or if you have suggestions or or input for us, we'd we'd love to hear it. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we still have two panelists. So any other questions? Christoph, did you have something? Now you just have back row no is showing up. Hey, hey uh, Chris, I just wanted to mention that <laughs> unfortunately, uh, when I log in to Zoom through my government computer, I'm not able to see the chat. So uh, if people have, uh, I, I was just reminded of that as, as Rowan had mentioned it. Um, so I just wanted to flag for people um, that they're welcome to, to connect directly to me, um, either on LinkedIn or, or email me if they have any specific questions. That's a terrific uh, Chris, offer. Uh, Chris, this is Raj speaking. Uh, a couple of questions to the panelists. Uh, first of all, excellent panel, uh, great set of comments, inputs. Uh, uh, Rachel, you referred to uh, hydrogen uh, uh, just a little bit. Uh, as we know, the energy density of uh, batteries is uh, relatively low compared to that of fuel cells. So fuel cells could end up making a lot more sense uh, for heavy trucks, long haul trucks, uh, even in the rail sector as well, freight and passenger. So could you comment on what uh, the government thinking is on uh, encouraging uh, the study and usage of uh, fuel cells? You're still muted, Rishi. Sorry, I was trying to use my keystroke to get off of it and I was hitting the wrong key. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think uh, fuel cells is uh, a really uh, good opportunity for certain applications. And so we, we do have dedicated work um, across the government working on making fuel cell electric vehicles um, and also other applications of fuel cells. So there are stationary applications of fuel cells as well um, to bring down the costs and uh, remove some of the technical barriers and challenges. Um, one of the things that I've heard a lot of in the transportation sector is that, um, especially from industry stakeholders that are, are investing in fuel cell uh, vehicles development, is that a, a lot of the, um, uncertainty depends on the delivered hydrogen cost. And so uh, making sure that we're also thinking about the, the supply chain of hydrogen and how to reduce those costs while also reducing emissions. Because as you know, we can make hydrogen th um, through um, SMR, but um, we that, that would still leave dependency on fossil fuels. And so really bringing down the cost of green hydrogen using renewables is, is key. The Department of Energy just recently, um, they've been working on fuel cell technologies for, for a very long time through the Fuel Cell Technologies Office, um, but they recently announced kind of a, a broader initiative that is uh, called High Shot. Uh, it's the hydrogen shot um, where they're trying to, um, in the next 10 years, get hydrogen uh, prices down to $1 per kilogram. Uh, which is a, a really big technical challenge, um, but it, it certainly is one that's going to enable not only the trans transportation applications, but also uh, potential for um, energy storage or grid services um, and, and many other applications. So the cool thing I think about hydrogen is that it's, it's, a, it's a more fungible fuel um, than some of the others that we're developing specific applications for. Um, and so it has a lot of different ways to reduce uh, costs and um, to enter the market. Uh, I also think that the global market will be a big player in this as well, because we've already seen uh, some Asian companies, specifically Japan, which does ha already have to import a lot of its energy, um, really wants to go to a fully hydrogen economy. And in those cases, uh, it makes a lot of sense to have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles um, because if you're going to have the hydrogen around for your economy, um, using it for transportation is, is really a, a good, um, easy kind of co-benefit um, 
So uh, I don't think that there, the, the technology is counted out by any means. I think we're gonna need it for some of the, especially harder to electrify using batteries um, and uh, maybe some applications where drop-in fuels don't work. Um, but, uh, but I think we're, we're still working on the plan to get there. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Any comments from Kelsey? Yeah, just, just a quick addition. I, our alternative fuel corridor program does include hydrogen. And, and I know so much of the focus recently has been on electric vehicles, um, but we do still have hydrogen in our alternative fuels. Um, and then wanted to add an, an additional thing that the um, infrastructure bill will, will add is um, it, it uh, directs federal highways to also work to designate medium and heavy duty truck uh, corridors for the purpose of good movement. Um, so uh, assuming those will include hydrogen, um, so we'll have kind of a, a different heavier use um, uh, corridor application. Good. Uh, a different question then, uh, uh, do you see automation autonomy playing a role with uh, decarbonization or just completely independent? Oh, sorry, is that to me? How about, how about either of you? <laughs> I mean, Kelsey, do you have a crystal ball? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's I think it's a hard one to call. I mean, uh, I think the focus right now is on decarbonizing transportation because then if if uh, automated vehicles are introduced, um, then at least we'll be uh, running more efficiently on and on cleaner fuels. Um, I think one of the concerns is that automated vehicles may may increase uh, VMT. Um, and traffic and congestion and a, a lot of things. Um, I think too that um, there's, there's a lot of conversation about automated vehicles and um, the equity of them. And on one hand, you can uh, make the argument that uh, automated vehicles may enable cheaper transportation costs. Um, so that maybe you don't have to own a vehicle or maybe you can share it with others or maybe you just have a subscription to transportation as a service uh, type of model. Uh, but the other hand is that uh, we generally see technology um, diffusion happening first by people who can pay for it, right? And so making sure that these automated vehicles wouldn't uh, negatively impact uh, disadvantaged communities, I think, is, is a really important key piece, especially to take into consideration as we build out policies around, around the use of automated vehicles. Yeah, and, and to briefly add, we firmly believe that um, access to electrified transportation should be equitable and recognizing the role that, that automated vehicles will play in that. Um, we certainly want to support that because we don't want to deny anyone uh, the ability to to travel by by clean transportation. Thank you. I second that. <laughs> Stan, you had a question. Uh, yeah, you mentioned the um, you know the goal of reduction in vehicle miles traveled, or at least the goal of not trying to increase vehicle miles traveled. Um, are you are um, are you looking at supporting um, micro mobility or, you know, more kind of bike and pedestrian facilities, other types of mobility, of course, transit that would encourage less, you know, traditional vehicle miles traveled and more alternative modes of active transportation? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to pass this to Kelsey, but I just want to say real quickly that uh, I apologies for the miscommunication, there is no goal to reduce VMT. Uh, actually, the goal is to, to provide as much uh, mobility choices for Americans as possible. And if that increases VMT, um, it might happen, but we also want to, you know, make sure that we're um, looking at the impacts of that. And so uh, transitioning to clean transportation, like Kelsey said, um, we want to make sure that people have access to that, um, but it, it's not. I just want to clarify that there's no goal, <laughs> no goal to reduce VMT um, because that could really put some restrictions on who gets who gets to use the VMT, right? Um, and we just want to make sure that it's equitable. 
Um, but I'm sure Kelsey has a lot of, um, I, I, I could wax on about all the, all the things in, in the bills and that we're excited about for the administration, but I think Kelsey has a lot more um, information about specific programs from DOT. I would just, I would just recite what she probably knows in much more detail. <laughs> No, yeah, I, I could talk about this for, for quite a while, um, but yeah, exactly what Rachel said. And, and, and as I mentioned in the, in the last answer, our, our goal is to provide, like Rachel said, as many options to as many people. And we recognize that not everyone travels by vehicle. So we're definitely in support of micromobility, active transportation methods uh, like biking. Um, so all of, all of those are very much on the table. For us, um, we're, we're looking at those options through um, all of our modes, through our Federal Transit Administration and through federal highways. Um, yeah, as, as exactly as, as Rachel said, as many options as we can, as equitably as possible, um, and recognizing the, the variety of ways that everyone has, has to travel across the country. Thank you. Well, I have a, a a final question in the last few minutes for our two Washington insiders. What are the chances that the infrastructure bill gets passed? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take this, Kelsey. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to know too, Chris. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think I'm very encouraged. Um, you know, it, being a, an insider uh, is funny because you get you get like your your internal work conversations, but then you also hear all this stuff on the news, and sometimes sometimes they're uh, on the same page, and sometimes they're not. So honestly, like I, I don't know that I would be able to speculate because I don't know which is more true at this point. Yep. <laughs> but it is really encouraging to see that we're making progress, right? Um, it's it's feeling more and more like it's going to happen um, because we continue these negotiations. Um, admittedly at a much higher level than, than me. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm hopeful too, and we'll probably find out just about the same time that, that all of you do, <laughs> that the bill yep. is passed. Um, <laughs> but we, we've got our fingers crossed. Kelsey, any, any follow-up? <laughs> no, um, just that we're, we, we are continuing to, to work on electric vehicles and are so excited for what the future will hold in this space. Yeah, I'm excited because the electric vehicle sales have really shot up uh, yeah. in the last year. So I, we may have turned the corner, we'll see. Yeah, and I, I, I will add one more thing, Chris, that I think is just really important to, to point out that these, these, and I think I already have before, but just to, <laughs> just to beat a dead horse here in the last minute, um, it's the, the packages that we have right now are just a, a one-time infusion of funds, right? There's a lot of really great work that's happening at the government level on an annual regular basis. And that's the foundation that got us to the point that we're able to do this infusion with new technologies, right? And so whether these bills get passed or not, or whether a certain program gets, uh, gets passed or is part of the package or gets left on the cutting room floor, the administration is dedicated to decarbonizing transportation as much as possible. Um, and that can happen through uh, these big pushes like the, the infrastructure and reconciliation bill, but it also happens on a regular basis through our agency and executive branch uh, actions. And so we're, we're dedicated to, um, to making these, these, big, these big shifts uh, to transition to clean transportation. Great. Okay, any final questions uh, from the group? Uh, if not, I will thank our panelists. Thank you very much, Rachel and Kelsey, for joining us. And very, very uh, inter educational. <laughs> Exciting Great, times, you. indeed. Thank you so uh, Raj, much, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Sorry, Rachel. No, I think we were just thanking you, Chris. And thanks okay, for thank you. organizing, too. <laughs> Take yeah. care. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Kelsey. And thank you, Chris. Uh, so uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, Joy. Uh, uh, so just to wrap up, uh, so uh, the entire day's uh, events, uh, 
just want to wrap up with the thought that uh, we have great deployment partners, uh, which is basically you, the audience. Uh, we have a ton more members who could not join us for various reasons. Uh, uh, so reach out to any and all of us. Uh, uh, Chris, who just moderated the panel now, Stan has been very active throughout the day. Uh, Lisa K was the force behind the whole day, putting pulling all together, all things together. And then I'm Raj. Uh, so we can look at information online at mobility21.cme.edu or traffic21.cme.edu. We work together uh, extremely well as, as a team. So reach out to us. Uh, let's come up with uh, great ideas. Uh, then take them out to uh, make a, a, a difference, make an impact in the real world. Uh, go from there. So thanks again. Uh, uh, looking forward to uh, engaging with you uh, as we move forward. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes left. If you have any closing comments, questions from anybody in the audience, uh, now is a good time to ask. You can raise your hand or you can speak up. Uh, most microphones are still muted. If you so, if you are speaking, your microphone may be muted. We just uh, main, maintain a, a second of silence or more. So looks like there are no no comments. Uh, so we are always available. Uh, we are very reachable. Uh, uh, so, so be in touch. Uh, and thanks for an excellent day. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Stan, anything else to say? Uh, no, just saying thanks everyone. Bye bye. Hi, all. <laughs>